Hello and welcome to Impact Africa, powered by Fintech TV on CNBC Africa. My name is Kavita Gupta. And I'm Vince Molinari, and we're coming to you today from the Javits Center in New York City. What amazing venue we're broadcasting from. Very, very excited and lucky to call it our home studio. Um, Vince, today we are talking about a very, very special topic, which I feel like Africa, India, a lot of emerging markets really realize that today, equal access means equal access, e equity, equal access to internet. Well, I don't know if there's a more pressing issue globally when we think about closing the digital divide and really granting access, particularly to remote locations, where we can begin to change the paradigm of economics, supply chain, education, healthcare, all as massive uh, downstream effects of closing that divide. For everything, right? Our first guest is Chris Fabian. Huge fan of Chris's. I mean, I am very lucky to call him a friend and, and an ad, I'm, I've been an advisor to his initiative, Giga, at UNICEF and ITU. And we are very fortunate to have Chris talking about how they're going to move billions across 18 countries in the world to have internet access to all. Couldn't be done without the technology, right? Absolutely. And then our second interview is with the head of Facebook Internet Connectivity for Africa, um, who is actually telling us how Facebook and like a lot of other technical companies, I think Twitter is doing some initiative, Google is doing some initiative, uh, coming to the region and trying to have that first customer directly converted using the internet access. Well, I, I think it's, you know, it's a combination, right? All of these big organizations are realizing there's a massive market opportunity here, right? A billion market. And, and think about the youth segment, right? Yeah. Almost 50% of the population is in the youth category. So if you can grant that access, begin to open up that marketplace, and it goes to everything that we continue to talk about, from commerce to healthcare to education. Very smart move. Oh yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm very excited for all of you guys to enjoy this show. Uh, coming up next. We have somebody who really pioneered, started, initiated this conversation, Chris Fabian. Chris co-leads Giga, a UNICEF ITU initiative to connect every school in the world to the internet. He's also the co-founder of UNICEF Crypto Fund, again, a big innovation at the heart of United Nations Association to actually invest in crypto companies or hold Bitcoin. He's also the co-founder of UNICEF's Innovation Unit, guiding the organization's innovation strategy, as well as advising Secretary General Barn on frontier technology issue around AI, data science, blockchain, and cryptocurrency. And last but not the least, he was a member of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People list in 2013. Chris, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. How are you doing? Well, thanks, Kavi. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm doing very, very well and I'm looking forward to talking about connectivity with you. So where are you connecting us from? Well, I'm, I'm lucky. I'm one of the, as are you, one of the 50% of people in the world who have pretty good internet access. So um, the wonderful thing about that is we could be anywhere. I'm here from New York today, uh, but, uh, but I think we are living in this world that we see is, is really global now uh, for, for those of us lucky enough to be connected. True. Um, Chris, in, in our world, or when I say the world of US and Euro, if there is a drop of internet for a minute or two minutes, we feel like the life has come still, like nothing is happening. And you are talking about going to places where internet probably has never really existed. It can be a first time access, it can be a first time proper access. How do you see the world there exists and where do you see internet creating such a big rift in access? Well, I mean, one of the things when we started our venture fund at UNICEF, we invested in a whole set of companies doing really incredible stuff with technology at the edge of where normal VC funds look for their deal flow. And we found companies in Malawi doing drones, companies in Colombia doing AI. And these wonderful companies all sort of stopped working as soon as they hit the edge of the network. And I think that was really important for us because what we saw was that the ability for an entrepreneur to succeed to grow their market, to grow their business was so correlated to where the network ends. And I think that you know, for us to have a little drop in our Zoom connection or whatever is kind of fine, but if I'm doing a, a business that looks towards the future, an internet-based business, and I can't reach my consumers for days at a time, I'm out. And so I would actually say like the, the problems of connectivity are 
just as stark in many places in the US and in Europe in poor parts of rich cities as they are in, in emerging markets and emerging economies. True, but I'm sure you must have seen with you have traveled all over Africa and so many places. I know you were a very early entrepreneur in the region. Um, you must have seen the vast divides, even between, let's say, in Kenya, between Nairobi and as farther you go from Nairobi, just based on internet. What has well, been one of the first experiences? One of the companies I founded was a Tanzanian company that was an ISP and, and web provider a long time ago now, almost 20 years ago. And one of the things we found in Tanzania was that the reason that people didn't use the internet was often that there was no internet of value for them. So it, it wasn't that they really couldn't get to it. I mean, it might've taken a little bit longer, but when they did get to it, it was, it was a foreign internet. It was an American internet. The services that existed on there didn't mean anything to somebody outside of Dodoma. And you couldn't use a credit card because you didn't have one. So, so it's like really about that. And I think localizing the experience of the internet, making sure that, it's, that it means something. When we set up our first drone and UAV corridor for training drone pilots in Malawi, um, that was a, a, a use of internet for certification, for flight path development, for engineering uh, that in Blantyre in Malawi that started to drive a local economy. And without that localized need, that localized reason for connecting, it really is this meaningless abstract kind of thing far off. And so I think that that immediacy is something that continues to drive us in our work. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for me, where I'm looking at is at one part, we are talking about drone technologies in Malawi. And other part, the more I learn about Giga, you are talking about that there is still a big need for connecting every school, every child to internet. I find these two worlds very disconnected. What am I missing here? If you look at the schools in a, in a map of schools in the world, which if you go to projectconnect.world, you can suddenly see schools that we're finding uh, around the world and mapping and putting online, and you can see their connectivity status. And what you see is that most of the schools aren't connected at all. So let's talk about Malawi. If you go into the south of Malawi, you find schools that not only aren't connected to the internet, but the teacher may not have been there in days or weeks. Uh, the kids may be sitting on the ground. If we can start to use connectivity as a driver for the rest of the infrastructure that we know is so important, I think we can do something to change the world. And I think we can do that by using schools as a unit of economic development. We know that in a school, kids learn, they gather information, they get access to opportunity. We know that we can count the schools, we can see where they are, and we can start to aggregate the demand based on these units, on these schools. And we know that if we can issue contracts for public procurement that use the school as the procuring institution, we can drive connectivity out so you can get the cable, you can get the satellite connectivity. And with that, you can drive electricity, you drive better roads, all of the other type of stuff that we take you know, for granted. Um, but you're doing it through this fundamental thing that everybody really wants now, which is to be connected to the future. So for us, the school is really a place that has always represented information, but is also a place that we can count, we can connect, and we can start to connect the community around it. So uh, let me turn it around in a different way. When I did a really big project around Piringa National Park in Congo, our first access point was electricity through hydroelectric station. So we used renewable energy as the first access and created the whole financial economy around it. When you're going to these schools, all of those places have electricity already available. Like how are you going to charge your phone? How is this whole router system going to work? Well, many of them don't. And I think this is the, the real joy of how financing can work. So if you just say to somebody, we're gonna pay you one euro per gigabyte or $1 per gigabyte, and you have to connect every school in the country, they'll probably tell you no, like the different schools are further away, they're less connected, we need to bring other stuff out there. But if you have a live map and you can actually see the economic constraints and the economic benefits to a company from connecting certain areas, you can start to do dynamic pricing. You can say, look, if you connect this area, there's this much retail that you're probably gonna bring in with you to your company. So connect the school, the community will certainly provide profits. But in that area over there, there's nobody to use it. So we might have to subsidize part of it or we might have to provide some kind of concessionary financing. And if you just treat a country as one whole plane, it's hard to make those differentiations for financing. But if you start to use data as the driver, you can build up a, an investment package that really looks at the most difficult to reach areas and offers a premium for pricing. So you say, listen, we'll pay six times as much for that gigabyte, because we know you have to drag the electricity with you. But in a part of the country that's already connected to the, the mains and the grid, you maybe pay less. So that type of articulated procurement was never possible uh, before having this ability to, to really have real-time data about, about our need. 
I really like this creative financing part of it. So what sort of institutes, individuals, corporates, like who you think are already super excited about it, being part of Kika directly, indirectly, and you think can really change the way this, these projects are done? Well, I have to tell you, I've learned a lot about debt financing in the last two years, stuff that I maybe never even, never even knew I wanted to not know. Uh, but the, the 15 countries that are our giga lead countries include Rwanda, Kenya, Sierra Leone, Niger, just in Africa, as well as countries in Central Asia and in South America. And many of these countries already have very exciting uh, financial packages bubbling in the government or in their innovation cities or in their financial cities. Um, and I think that a lot of them are looking at this kind of blended finance approach where you can take some public money to underwrite certain public utilities and stack private money and institutional money on top of that. So it's not by any case, it's not new when we talk to a government um, and particularly governments with very sort of sophisticated ministers of information or digital, they're not surprised, but what they are surprised about is that we can use a school as a driver for that public line of financing. So that's kind of neat. And on the corporate side, our partners, SoftBank, uh, Investment Advisors, and Ericsson are both helping us think through the kind of capital markets instrumentation we'll need and also the data collection that we'll need. And we're excited to be onboarding new partners all the time. And you may have seen the news just last week that Elon Musk joined Giga as a, as a, a funder of our work. And I think that, that the support from him and his foundation will also be key to driving these models of, of what the future of finance looks like in emerging economies. I hope you're not getting some Dodge coins. Well, I did. I told Elon that he could pay in Bitcoin if he wanted. Um, Doge is still a little further out from, from our appetite, but we'll see what happens. Crypto is a funny place. <laughs> but you had UNICEF as one of the first international organization to actually have a crypto wallet. So why not now? Yeah, well, so, but it all ties together. And the reason that we were so keen to make UNICEF be able to take crypto assets and onboard them in oof, 2018, 2019, um, and this was a really big deal. I mean, it's still the largest public institution that I know of that can take Bitcoin and Ethereum natively, hold them and disperse them as that crypto. So that's a, that's a really big deal. And it's allowed us to fund as UNICEF companies in all over the world and do it instantly, almost instantly, in a matter of seconds, to do it quickly and transparently. And we needed that functionality uh, because we were looking forward to Giga. We needed to be able to pay quickly, to pay across borders, to see what's happening from our payments and to see it in real time. And that's capacity that a blockchain-based financial system allows for. It's harder to do that with dollars. You send a dollar somewhere, you see something later on. But if you're sending smart money, smart digital money somewhere, you can see the impacts in real time. So we set that institutional capacity up and we're able to use it now and take advantage of it in our work on Giga. And I think you'll see digital payments with cryptocurrency for connectivity before the middle point of this year. Oh, that's gonna be very exciting. Chris, my last question before I go. Um, as you're growing this ecosystem, as the internet connectivity happening in the schools and remote areas, how do you see a whole ecosystem building up? How do you see the impact of it in the GDP of the country at local and the national and international level? I think for the first time, we'll be able to see that actually unfold in front of us. And it goes back to the two things I talked about earlier. First of all, our venture fund and the investments we made in these small companies all over the world, which couldn't scale because of lack of connectivity. And second, our ability to pay and to make investments with crypto or digital currency. And if you bring those two things together, you can imagine that as we connect schools and as we drive this kind of financial inclusion network out further, we give local entrepreneurs the capacity to extend their businesses. And at the same time, we create a way to pay them, to invest in them from an early stage with crypto, which is very exciting. It gives you a kind of liquidity in your early stage VC investments that you don't have traditionally, but it also gives you a transparency into what's happening uh, in these new and emerging types of, of, of technology that you just wouldn't have had 20 years ago. So um, I think that having the school as the anchor for it means a lot emotionally. It means that you can give students access to the future of opportunity, but also it allows us to bring commerce and, and I think a more fair economy uh, out to a lot of people, to the 50% of people who are excluded from it right now. I'm just going to do one more last question, Chris. What's next for Giga over next one year or two? I thought you were going to ask an easy one. Okay, well, we'll take the hard one. Never. Um, it's, it's pretty simple. So what you'll see over the next year is that we are 
making some uh, prototypes of what this new financial network looks like. So in a few countries, we're doing what we call Giga Accelerate, where we're connecting a few hundred schools, but we're building in the ability to do some of the crypto payments, to do some of the blockchain-based accounting, and to start seeing what happens when these schools have digital software on them for kids to learn, and it's all happening in real time. So that's one thing. The second thing is that I hope that you'll see a pretty exciting, uh, at least premonition, of what could happen for a capital markets instrument that would look at financing connectivity at global scale. The total ticket price to connect every school in the world is at least 420 billion US, if not more. So we need something pretty impactful to start getting in there and opening up the finance that we know is out there but isn't aligned. Uh, and so I hope that by the middle of this year, um, you'll see a lot more in terms of uh, what a big instrument could look like that would bring actual investment in to some areas which are not uninvestable, but certainly are more high risk than uh, many institutions would have investment appetite for. And uh, I'd invite everybody to keep watching on, on the projectconnect.world website, because there you can actually see progress in real time. You can see these schools lighting up as we connect. Them. So hopefully that will hold us to account. Uh, I'm absolutely going to continue to watch Project Connect. And thank you so much, Chris. This project is huge, but it's very, very plausible and possible. And I think over the next five to six years, when you're back on the Time Magazine list for enlightening so many schools, I'm just going to say we knew it before that. Well, thank we'd love you. to come back and talk about this at any time, Kavita. It's really been a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Coming up next, Welcome to a FinTech TV Africa, Mr. Kojo Bwachi. Kojo Bwachi is Facebook's Director of Public Policy for Africa. He's an ICT for Development Practitioner with over 17 years experience working with governments, fixed line and mobile operators, development partners, online service providers, content developers, entrepreneurs, and civil society organizations. It's such a pleasure to have you with us today. Uh, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. Really pleased to be with you as well. Awesome. So your job must be very exciting, Kojo. <laughs> Facebook, it, it... Africa, right in the middle of uh, connectivity, and uh, driving the digital agenda for the continent. How exciting is this? Uh, really, really exciting most of the time. Um, like, any, like, like anyone's job, I think there are days that are super exciting and then there, there can be days that are super, super tough. I'm thankful, thankful that there aren't days that are ever slow. Um, the, the pace of change as we know it with the digital, with the digital revolution is, is fast. If you can get in front of it, you're in a good place. If you can keep up with it, you're, you're also in a good place. So um, I, I'm, I'm thankful for not having slow days. Yeah, that's awesome. So what are the trends that we should expect in the next five years from where you're sitting, from where Facebook is sitting on the continent? Yeah, I, look, I, I think we're confident. I think we're, we're coming out of what many would describe as uncertain uh, uncertain times. And, and, you know, I say coming out, I think we're closer to the end of a pandemic than we are to the start of it, certainly the developments we've seen in vaccines. But throughout the pandemic and before, Facebook has been confident about the developments we're seeing in Africa from an ICT point of view. Core to that is getting people online. Um, you'll know we have 200 million people who use our applications on the continent. Um, we want to grow this. Uh, we're desperate to grow this um, as quickly as possible. And we're mindful that our goals with growing internet usage, not just Facebook usage, but internet usage, because we understand the development impact of that, are aligned with many of the goals of government in region, the CSO partners we work with, and the hundreds of millions of Africans that want to get online. Uh, depending on what stat you read at the moment, about 30 to 35% of Africans are online. That's way too low when you think about our, our, our friends in the Middle East, where it's 50 to 55%, or our friends in Europe, where 88 to 90% of people are online. We need to change that. And I think we're confident that will change. And that's why we've made some of the investments that have been well documented now. I think there was a, a lot of uh, news and appreciation 
from, from, from governments and from media, from civil society and from users who understand the, the impact that our two Africa development, our two Africa uh, investment will have. Us and our partners such as Orange, MTN and YOC are investing in a cable that will, for the first time, link East to West Africa or West to East Africa running around the South of the continent. And we're really confident in that will have an impact on connectivity in the region, giving uh, uh, many operators the incentive to go out and, def and provide more 4G and more 5G to, to people in region. But it's not just the, the, the big investments or the huge investments in submarine cables uh, like to Africa, but it's also the investments we're making in backhaul connectivity. And we've heard for a long time with Facebook from mobile operators and from governments that one of the big things holding the continent back from this explosion in internet use, from, from meeting the pent up demand in internet use that we know is there is backhaul connectivity. So if you look at the investments we've made in the last uh, three or four years in, in places like Uganda, in DRC, in Nigeria, in South Africa, these, this is to provide that backhaul fiber connectivity to enable operators to hopefully reduce their costs of investment and to go out and connect people. And the model that we've used for that is really important as well. These, this, this open access model, which enables people, you know, clear and transparent pricing, any operator can connect. We're hoping that that will, that will really accelerate things. So we're really confident about the future of, of the continent first and foremost, and the part that internet use has to play in it. No, that is really awesome. The fact that you're looking at it from, um from a, from a you know, pan-Africa and a, a bigger picture perspective where you're saying, first, you know, let's get internet rolling, let's get more people online and we understand yeah. how important or, you know, this is. So you mentioned 200 million Facebook users on the continent. So yeah. Do they have any patterns of peculiarity or certain aspects in how they use Facebook as opposed to other markets? Hey. They do. I just want to quickly return, Irene, to what you talk about in the big picture. And I know we've got a quite a, an interview to come and I'm looking forward to that. But I know I, I, I do want to stress that we are looking at more than just connectivity. I think we'll talk in this, in, this interview about the investments we're making in training, et cetera. And I think that is the big picture, connecting people and enabling them to use that connectivity really well. I think that your, your, your question about the trends that we see is a great question as well. I think uh, our mission is a global mission. Our provision of applications like WhatsApp, Instagram, and Facebook is global. And you know, more than 3.3 billion people around the world use our applications on a monthly basis. Um, that mission of, of giving people the, the, the ability to, or the power to, um, uh, to build community and bring the world closer together is core to what we do in Africa as well. Having said that, we have seen some uses in Africa that have really, really infused us and invigorated our willingness to invest and to work with partners across the continent to move things forward. I think groups is something that we know works really well that Facebook has sprung up. I think 1.4 billion people around the world are involved in some sort of Facebook group facilitated um, by, by our apps. But we're also mindful that the groups in, in Africa have a, a, an amazing impact. And we know that groups are springing up. Tens of millions of Africans are involved in groups, many of which are core or central to uh, improving their communities, recognizing issues that are there now and potentially in the future, and helping to improve and alleviate these issues. I can think of I can think of so many, but I mean one that jumps out is is Love Cape Town, which is a group of eighteen thousand people that use this Facebook page to come together in their neighbourhood, recognise the issues that are at hand, most notably with COVID, and to work together and to try and reduce the to to, to flatten the curve with COVID. It's just one example of the way people are are using the application. Great, thank you so much, Kojo. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. And Thank you. I wish you all the best in your efforts uh, across the continent. We are all um, watching to see uh, what new developments and how all this new integration with WhatsApp, Instagram and Facebook is going to do to, um, to the continent. And uh, we're excited for you. Thank you.
Confident, what great stuff. We're really looking at what Chris is doing at Giga and UNICEF and Kojo at Facebook. It, it's really advancing this whole paradigm of access to the internet. Yeah, and I think what I found a very interesting common thread between those two is an international support organization going and creating internet access. And then you have tech companies going and saying, hey, we need to provide internet access because this is where our next customer is going to come. There is a finally alignment of impact, even though if it is for business or it is just to create a better life. Right, it's private sector government organizations merging together for the same common goal. And yeah, and what Chris mentioned about how SoftBank, which is considered a big financial entity, is really coming and helping them out to figure out um, how to do the first internet bond and how to have connectivity. Um, it's It's been very educative. And, and I don't want to go back to it again, but thinking about an internet bond, an innovative product to accelerate this, it's, it's really just amazing to me. Yeah, uh, I hope you also enjoyed the way we did. Uh, please check out fintech.tv for more and such amazing impact stories. Looking forward to seeing you guys again.